Welcome to this session, which is um, sponsored by the University of Canberra, which is where I'm working. Um, my name is Matthew Ricketson. I'm the uh, journalism professor there. And uh, we're sponsoring a session. We're bringing Bill Powers out to Australia because um, we think that his book has got some really interesting things to say and, and, and really we want to get that, or I want to get that message out to as many people as possible. Um, and I thought I'd start by giving you some sense of his background and um, because he's a well-known journalist in America and now a well-known author, but, but perhaps not as well-known to us here, uh, he began his professional career as, a, as, an, as an aide to a senator, um, John Chafee, who is a, what you might call a liberal Republican, which in, in, uh, in, was, was how Bill described it to me last night, which in, means a more moderate Republican, um, I guess probably down the other end of the scale to the Tea Party mm -hmm. uh, people. And then um, uh, Bill's first main job in, in journalism was working as a research assistant for Bob Woodward, um, the famous uh, journalist of Watergate fame. And, uh, and he worked for him between 19, 1988 and 1991 on the book that eventually became uh, known as The Commanders. Uh, takes in a number of things, but, but is best known for looking at the first Gulf War uh, back then. Um, then Bill started working on the Washington Post and was there for much of the 1990s. Uh, did some news reporting, but also did quite a lot of work in feature writing on the sort of style section and so on. Then worked on a, um, uh, briefly on the New Republic, which is a sort of a, a journal of opinion and ideas under Michael Kelly, who was the editor and who, who wanted him to come and work there. Um, left there and started working for another uh, uh, magazine called The National Journal, which was a more, um, was even more uh, policy oriented and so on. And, and Bill became known for writing a regular media column um, both at the Washington Post and then took that work forward on in his later, uh, later work with uh, the National Journal and the New Republic and won in fact two um, National Press Club awards in America for his media criticism work. And so we've got a, we've got a picture of someone who's a, a very successful journalist who's been in the middle of mainstream news media during the 19, late 1980s, 1990s, into the 2000s. And the media world is shifting around him, um, as I'm sure you're aware of. Um, uh, and so he got to a point, having been a very successful journalist, having seen how those sorts of things work, but not being entirely satisfied with both the world of the media and the sorts of things that he was writing about and covering. And I, I, that's the point at which I'd like to bring you in, Bill, because that's where you started to, to ask some questions that eventually have come to fruition in, in this book. But there's a bit more, I'd like you to sketch out that uh, story, sure. if you could, to see yeah. how that happened. Thank you, Matthew. I just want to say, first of all, that I'm so happy to be here at the festival, that the festival invited me to be here, that the University of Canberra uh, supported my coming here, and my publisher, Scribe Publications, also organizing it for me and making it all happen. I just love Melbourne. This is my first time here. I've been to Sydney once before, but never to Melbourne. And I'm delighted you all came to join us today. Um, so thank you for the summary of my career, uh, Matthew. Um, Basically, what happened that led to the book was in the late 90s, I, early, early last decade, I began to realize that as the digital era unfolded, the work I'd been doing previously, which was criticizing the content of journalism and the content of the media, is the New York Times doing a good job on this story, is CBS News covering the war appropriately, I was doing that kind of work, was leaving out this other new question that was emerging for all of us, which is the, the devices themselves. You know, Marshall McLuhan said, famously said, the medium is the message. And I began to realize that the medium itself, this new high speed, increasingly 24 seven way of connecting to each other was changing so many aspects of how we live, how we work, how we play, how we have our families, even how we think. And I didn't really see anyone addressing that in my world of sort of writing about technology. I saw a lot of people reviewing the new gadgets, often very enthusiastically urging us to get more and more connected and so forth, which I was very happy to do. I'm a big fan of technology and was an early adopter of a lot of these um, new forms of connectedness. But I began to notice some downsides 
in my life, and I don't know if you want me to go on and mention sort of those categories yeah. of things, but I began to realize that in all these dimensions of my life that meant so much to me, my work, my ability to sort of think clearly and creatively and come up with new ideas as a writer, uh, my family life, my connection to my wife and my son, who was then very small, um, all my relationships, the more connected I got digitally, the more I felt my attention span sort of narrowing, I felt this growing desire to constantly be hopping from task to task, almost as if my brain was being trained by all that screen time and having all those windows open at the same time to think that way always, even when I was away from the screen. And I began hearing from other people, you know, at first just scattered um, anecdotal uh, complaints along the same lines, not just uh, older people adjusting to the new devices, but people of all ages. The more connected people were, often I noticed, the more enthusiastic they were about the devices, they more, the more they started to mention to me this sort of puzzle they were feeling, where it, it was as if the, the rhythm of life itself was changing in a fundamental way, but we hadn't described it. So I really wanted to get my arms around this as a writer, and I didn't really see a way to do it. It's so abstract. It's such a big question. But I got this invitation to spend a semester at Harvard University as a fellow, open-ended invitation, uh, you'll have an office, you'll have a research assistant, you can do anything you want with the semester, you just have to turn in an essay at the end of the semester on the topic of your choice. It was like out of the blue, dream invitation for a writer. So I said yes, of course. And I went and I decided to study this question. And I took a little tiny piece of it, which is this assumption that was running around the culture then and still is now, that paper, paper as a medium of communication is about to disappear that we don't have any use for this medium anymore that has served us so well for 2,000 years, that we're going to be doing everything, reading, living, relating, everything is going to happen on the screen. So I told Harvard I would like to do my essay about the future, if any, of paper and what we've learned from that technology and if it is indeed dying as a medium, why are we letting go of it? The more connected I got digitally, the more I started to look at this kind of communication as a little bit of an island in the chaos, a place where I could go and sort of quiet my mind and focus on one thing. And here everybody was saying it was a useless tool. There was no point to have it. So I spent a semester uh, doing the research, looking at the history of the medium that is paper, a print media. I wrote this essay called Hamlet's Blackberry. OK, so where did, where did Hamlet come in? So in the essay, it's a little different from Hamlet's role in the book. But in the essay, I, I basically found this moment Coincidentally, when I was a fellow at Harvard, on the side, I decided to take a Shakespeare course. You're allowed to take any courses you want when you have one of these fellowships. I took a course in the tragedies with a wonderful professor named Stephen Greenblatt. And uh, in the course of reading Hamlet, we came across this moment where Hamlet, most people watching the play don't notice this moment. It happens very quickly. But the first time Hamlet meets the ghost of his father, and he hears this shocking news from the ghost that he, was not, he wasn't killed by a serpent's bite, he was murdered. Hamlet begins feeling in his clothing. He says, my tables, my tables, patting his clothes. And when we hear that, we think of a table like this. But in fact, he was looking for a technology, a device that was incredibly popular in Shakespeare's time that was, in effect, the Blackberry of the Renaissance, actually. It was a little booklet that people carried around. And on one side of it, there was a surface, not a paper surface, but it was made out of a kind of plaster-like material and a metal stylus that you pulled out of the spine, just like the styluses we use today. And people would take notes on this during the day and, and sort of to-do lists, people they'd run into, things they wanted to remember. The beauty of the device, these tables, was that you could wipe, swipe it clean, erase it, and start over, which was a completely new thing for people. There had been wax tablets before, but they didn't have this ability to easily remove what was there. And the message is that in an age of print, when print technology was really causing people of that period, believe it or not, to feel information overload, to feel really overwhelmed by the inability to keep up with all the books being published, by newspapers, which had just appeared then, and were this new form of adding information to your lives, this was a way to bring your life under control and to actually remove information from your life once you were done with it. So it was sort of a relief, and Hamlet talks about it as a way of clearing this distract, distracted globe, he calls his mind. And I found it fascinating that in the, in the Elizabethan era, 
there was the problem of distraction, ADD almost, Shakespearean ADD, and that this was something people were dealing with. Now, the other reason I used it, Matthew, in the, in the, in the, in the essay was that it was actually the persistence of an older technology, handwriting. People, you had to use handwriting on this surface in a time when people were predicting the death of handwriting. We have print technology. Why should any of us need to, need to be using handwriting? A decade from now, handwriting will be dead. Of course, it didn't happen. This older technology turned out to be a very useful tool that people continued to use on into the future. And I wound up predicting in my essay, which I called Hamlet's Blackberry, Why Paper is Eternal, that paper itself will either continue to play a role in our lives going forward, or that digital technology will become so indistinguishable from this tool, we'll, we'll learn so many of the good things that this tool has done for us in its own design, that it will be as if we still have books with us made from paper forever. There are predictions that we'll soon have books just like this within the next 10 or 15 years that can be simply turned into a new book by pushing a button wirelessly, but it will actually have paper-like pages, just like this book. So that's sort of the, the argument I was making for paper persisting, perhaps in a slightly new form. Hmm. Okay. There's a, there's a section in the book, um, in that chapter on uh, Hamlet's Blackberry, where I, I think it's useful to, if you like, try and take people back in time a little bit, mm -hmm. because the being illiterate um, had very real consequences. So that we tend to think of now post the Enlightenment when literacy is is almost universal, that we take it for, for granted. But at that stage, it actually had some real political yes. um, uh, what's the word, weight or, or consequences if you weren't literate. Yes. So I talk about this in the chapter in the book about uh, Hamlet's Blackberry, about this device. And it was a time, Shakespeare's lifetime, was a time in which the printing press mm -hmm. was a very controversial device, even though it was 150 years old by yep. this time. It had been invented in the mid-15th century. And now Shakespeare's lifetime is the early 17th century when he was writing some of the later plays. And there were actually riots about the printing press, illiterate people feeling that this new technology was actually being used to oppress them and to deny them privileges in society because they couldn't read. And Shakespeare actually worked that detail into a couple of his plays where he has kind of a peasant's re revolt, one play in particular, that is people actually going after the printing press and trying to destroy it because they fear that this new technology is basically destroying their way of life. Exactly, and it's, it's, um, it's one of the things that, that I think is most uh, interesting about the book is that you, you look at the, the various, what you call the seven philosophers of screens, and we'll, I mean, there's Plato, there's Seneca, there's... Yeah, do you want me to describe what, how that works? Yes. Yes. Sorry. So what I do in the book is to solve this conundrum that I talked to you earlier about, how do you live happily in a digital world, make the most of these devices, which I'm a great fan of, but also, how do you deal with this burden that they impose of being so busy, so surrounded by information all the time? Sometimes it's as if we're living in a crowd all the time with Facebook and Twitter and all these tools basically around us all the time, interrupting us, distracting us. How do you strike a balance? So what I do in the book, in the first part, I set up the conundrum. I call it the conundrum of connectedness. In the second part, I go back in history. I was familiar with the history of technology enough to know that there had been moments like this moment before, moments like the one we're living through now, where, as in Shakespeare's time, a new technology came along that shook up everyday life, made people very excited because of all the possibilities of reaching out to information and other people, but at the same time imposed this burden and this challenge. And I knew people had dealt with it. So in each, I take seven moments from history where this happened, and in each of those moments I look at one person. I call them the seven philosophers of screens, screens being my shorthand for our technologies today. And with each of these philosophers, I basically try to draw some practical lessons about how we can strike a healthier balance today. Two purposes in doing this. One is that some lessons in how we can be more balanced and thoughtful and mindful in our own connectedness today. But two, I found that these stories, as I discovered them in my research of these people, gave me solace about our ability to actually figure out this conundrum and take the digital age to the place where it really should go, which is that these technologies are bringing us closer together in the best possible ways, making us more creative, more thoughtful, really building a better society, which is what they should be doing for us. And I think we haven't gotten to the point yet where we have figured out how to do that. You're trying to find a balance, which at, um, at one level is a sort of, uh, it doesn't make for a very 
uh, dynamic headline in a newspaper, does no, it? You know, no. author, balance. author urges yeah. balance, you know, no. um, it sort of no. doesn't quite. In fact, when I sold the book, um, you know, there were a number of publishers bidding on the book and the idea, and there was a sort of impetus with a few of them for this to be a pol an anti-technology mm -hmm. polemic. You know, basically, I hate digital which I wasn't willing to do because it's not my point of view, but I was completely aware that that sells. Mm -hmm. But that's it sells... The, uh, it, the Nick Carr book, on Swallows, Shallows? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, that's a really, actually a wonderful book, Nicholas yep. Carr's book, uh, The Shallows, in terms of understanding how the brain is affected by digital technology. It is a pessimistic book, mm -hmm. and, and that was another thing that I wasn't. You know, I'm yep. really not a pessimist about where these devices are, are taking us or where we, we should be taking ourselves with the help of the devices. Um, I'm an optimist. But what I've learned from history is that it can take a while to figure out this challenge. Shakespeare, as I said, was living 150 years after the invention of the printing press, and I don't want it to take that long for us to really build a good, healthy digital society where we're connecting in the best sense of the word. So why don't we start now? Why don't we learn these lessons from the past and integrate them into our own world, which is also different from those times, but has a lot of amazing parallels and see what happens. And I think balance is the key word. So there was a publisher that wanted me to do that book, and HarperCollins, and that's who I went with. Right, okay. So let's, let's try and be a little bit clear about what, what, first of all, the problem is, because you've already said that there are lots of things about new technologies that you like and you engage with and so on. Um, and they do, do all sorts of remarkable yeah, things that, that, that if you kind of draw a line in the sand 10 or, or 15 years ago were just inconceivable. Yes. Um, Wikipedia, YouTube, etc. No, all sorts of things. Wonderful. Yes. So what, what's the problem? What's the that needs to be resolved? The problem, and this was a hard thing to describe in the book, and I finally wound up settling on this, it's, it's almost a metaphor really, of the crowd, of, of life in the crowd, because that is sort of the consistent challenge that goes back to ancient times with every new technology, which is connective technologies draw us closer to everybody else in the world and make our lives busier rather like being in a crowd. You know, more tasks, more stuff to process, basically. Now that can be a wonderful thing. Processing information is what brings us so many riches in our lives and leads to success and prosperity and all these things. Meeting other people is what really brings us the, the, the most rewarding aspects of our lives, relationships, families, and so forth. But there is a point you reach of spending time in a crowd around the clock where it begins to weigh on you and, and exact costs. I referred to a few of the costs earlier. You know, one of them is attention span. Mm. I began to feel that I was dividing my attention into such thin slices that I actually couldn't do one task. This is away from the screen, but I'd been so trained by the screen to think this way. I found myself, I'd be brushing my teeth, and I would start organizing my sock drawer with the other hand just so I'd have another thing to do. And I'd want a third task. I'd want something else to be looking at or something. And I realized it was because somehow I was spending so much time on the screen all day, I was trying to keep busy all the time. It was training me to do that. Um, in terms of work, you know, these tools promise efficiency and can make us much more efficient and productive. But if you misuse them, they begin to have the opposite effect. There's something called recovery time. Psychologists call recovery time which is what happens when you're doing task A, it can be any task at all on the screen, and you interrupt that task to do task B. So let's say you're on your email and you get a little alert that somebody has made a comment on Facebook that you should pay attention to. You go over to task B. When you try to go back to task A to resume what you were doing, there is a recovery time that can be 5, 10, 20 times the amount of time you were away to recover, to immerse yourself again in task A, to get your focus back and do your best work. That is a lot of time. Mm. If you spend your day toggling constantly between tasks, as many workers now do, sitting in their cubicles in the office, you're basically never recovering. Mm. You're never getting down to that focused kind of work that is really the most productive kind of work. So in a sense, these tools of efficiency are becoming tools of inefficiency mm. if we don't use them wisely. Um, and the third element was really the interpersonal. I call this in the book, I use my own family as the example. I, we, my wife and I started to call it the vanishing family trick. We would, be, uh, we would finish dinner on, you know, say a Friday night at home, and we would gather in the living room for a little together time, conversation with the dog and the two cats. And one by one, each of us would sort of say, you know, I have to go get a glass of water. 
or I have to go to the bathroom, or I have to go check something. That was the all-purpose excuse. And one by one, we would disappear from the living room. It would take 10 minutes maximum. We'd all be gone. Of course, you know where we were going. We were going to our respective screens, which happened to be at different corners of the house. By the time we really noticed this was a problem, my son was about seven or eight years old, so he was coming into his own as a kind of a conversationalist, a budding reader. He was learning to really talk to us, you know, in the way that a real person talks. And I was realizing that I was barely getting to know him. We weren't even doing eye contact so much anymore as a family, and we began to realize it was because of the screens. So that's sort of a flavor mm. of the mm. cost that I felt I was paying as an individual, that we were paying as a family, and that I felt organizations were paying yep. in terms of the work costs. And you've, you've quoted some studies about those yeah. that have been done, various costs and so on, and you've also, um, you know, that's also the work, some of the work that Nicholas Carr and others have done to kind of, if you like, show us that there are some costs and they're becoming larger. There's, there's something also that's a little bit harder to put your finger on, but, but I think you captured it really well in, a, in, a, in an anecdote you tell early on in the, uh, in the book about a, a trip that you were making from where you were living to yes. visit your mother. Yes. And um, it's, it's worth, it's worth talking yes. about and reading because it, it kind of gets to a slightly different place to the, you know, studies have shown 10 people out of 15, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Well, let me just say that the reason I, I told this story that I'm about to read you is that these studies that Matthew just mentioned were coming out over the last decade about the costs of connectedness in the workplace, at home, all these different things I mentioned. There were actually university institute studies were coming out. But they would, if you looked at them in the news coverage, they'd be this sort of footnote, you know, way at the back of the newspaper or deep inside the website where you couldn't find it. And of course, on the front page, it was always, you know, everybody's on Facebook. Everybody's now doing Twitter, you know, connect, connect, connect. There was this other kind of minor key message behind all the exhortations we were getting to connect that I felt was just as important, if not more important, and I felt it was being overlooked and that people sort of weren't completely in touch with this counter trend that was happening that was troubling. So I decided to use my own life as a kind of a metaphor, and this story sort of gets at both the upside and the downside of connectedness in a way that I thought might help people. So I'll just read this, it's just a couple pages. This is chapter two of the book, it's called Hello Mother, The Magic of Screens. I'm in my car driving to my mother's house. She lives about two hours from me and close to one of those small city airports where it's easy to park out front and the lines are short and the security people are friendly. When I travel for work, I try to book my flights out of that, that airport and I get to visit my mother on both ends of the trip. This time I'm catching an evening flight and she's cooking dinner. As usual, I got a late start and won't be arriving anywhere near the time she's expecting me, so I need to call her to say I'll be late. I wait for a stretch of empty highway where it feels safe to look away for a few seconds. I open my mobile phone and hit the 4 key, which is programmed with her home number. A photo of my mother appears on the screen, a head and shoulders shot that I took months ago with the phone's camera. I later selected it as her ID photo, so it comes up automatically when I call her or she calls me. I really like this image of her, and I contemplate it for a moment before putting the phone to my ear. She's wearing a pink and white striped sweater and staring up at the lens with a certain cat that swallowed the canary expression she always gets just before bursting into a laugh. She laughs a lot, so this is a characteristic look for her. In other words, the photo captures something essential about my mother. When she answers, I tell her I'm on my way but running a little behind, and she chuckles knowingly. We've had this conversation so many times, it's kabuki now, and we both know our parts. She says she'll hold dinner, and why don't I call again when I'm 20 minutes away? I agree to do this and tell her I can't wait to see her, and we sign off. I take the phone from my ear, glance again at the photo, then hit end and watch it disappear. Driving along, I feel an unexpected surge of emotion. I'm thinking about how fun it always is to spend time with my mother, how lucky I was to be born to such a, compa a warm, companionable person. Lately, I've noticed shades of her humor in my son, and I wonder now if he somehow inherited that from her. Have they isolated a gene for good-naturedness? As the minutes pass and I drive along, these thoughts about my mother flow into new ones. In my consciousness, the smile from the photo merges with the pine woods on either side of the highway and the jazz playing on the radio, beamed down from a satellite miles above the earth. Memories rise up out of nowhere and flit around me in the car. They're not specific memories of particular events, but rather scenes in which I see my mother doing normal, habitual things. 
In the video archive of the mine, these would be the generic clips I filed under mom. There she is walking across a lawn, sitting under a beach umbrella with a book, talking to someone at a party, holding her sides as she breaks up over a funny story. For a while, the car is a floating cloud of filial affection and, well, joy. It's extraordinary, this feeling of time out of time. Everything dreary and confusing about my quotidian life has dropped away. I'm not the rushed, cornered, inadequate creature I often feel like. I'm absorbed in these memories, which seem to come from a place both beyond me and deep inside me, as if far and near, outward and inward, have come together in a new way. My mother and I are no longer connected in the literal sense as we were minutes earlier, yet I'm feeling a connection to her that is stronger than the one we had when we were actually chatting. Even as I enjoy this, I find myself thinking about the tool that engendered it, the unprepossessing, low-end, clamshell-style phone now sitting dormant in the cup holder. How did it do that? So the point of that is obviously the wonderful connection that this device enabled me to have with my mother. It wouldn't have happened unless I'd made that phone call. But the point is also that the connection went to a new place, got richer, grew, really blossomed, after I put the device away. I say a little bit later in that chapter, I opened up a gap between myself and my digital life, and that's where all the goodness happened. That's where the best stuff came from. And I think that in the digital age so far, we're trying to teach ourselves to erase those gaps, mm. to actually have our digital tasks piled on so, um, so numerously, so yeah. many at the same time, that we don't have any gaps at all. That we're well, just right. going if, from if, one task to another. If, yes. if that is happening, if you're constantly looking at the next this or that, you actually are not giving your, your head any space to yeah. do any of that ruminating or imagining. Yes. And I was, I was thinking about this, in the con I was trying to explain the other day to someone what the book was about and so on, and I, I said, after talking about that story, I said, it's, it's, it's like when someone says to you, I was thinking about you the other day, and it's, it's a nice feeling when someone says that to you because it shows that there's a kind of connection between you and that person which, which goes beyond and just sitting here one-on-one one on one happens in other places and other, you know, other people's minds and so on. So it's And it's not just utilitarian. Yeah. It's yeah. almost a transcendent connectedness. The flaw of this story, if I may say so, that I've learned since the book came out, is that the story is very personal. And it's about a mother-son connection, which is sentimental and so forth. And the book, you know, is about more than that. Mm -hmm. It's actually about, as I said, it's about all these dimensions of digital life where these gaps are incredibly important and valuable, including the work that we do. I gave a speech to a conference of lawyers in New York City recently. And at the end of the speech, one of the lawyers raised his hand from the back of the room and said, you know, I love what you're saying about gaps, but I'm an attorney in a competitive world, and if a client is trying to reach me, I can't say, sorry, I'm in the gap. <laughs> You know, <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's great you had that experience with your mom, but what does this have to do with being a lawyer in a competitive world? And my answer to him was, you know, I don't think you're going to be the best lawyer you can possibly be if you're effectively doing what I'm saying is the problem, which is toggling from one little digital thing to another all day long and not bringing your best creative powers to bear in your work as an attorney. And if your law firm the partners who are running it don't understand that, I think they're going to have a problem down the road. And in fact, a lot of businesses are discovering this, but that's, that's another story. Well, yeah, it is. And, and it's um, what, I mean, one of the things you discovered in doing the research is that in fact it is some of the, the technology companies who are, who are running into this problem, if you like, and are asking themselves about how to solve it. Right. Um, and so, I mean, there's a, there's a clip that you showed me um, from YouTube, which is kind of pertinent to this point, and perhaps this is a good point to... Yeah, let me just, if I could introduce yeah. it. Um, so, um, my, in each of the chapters with these philosophers, I try and have a modern connection to these long-ago people. So one of my philosophers is Ben Franklin, the American inventor and statesman and, you know, just thinker, wonderful figure in our history, who had a problem with his own connectedness. He was incredibly gregarious and um, basically couldn't stop himself from socializing. If he were alive today, he would, he would find himself on Facebook 24-7. <laughs> and what he wound up doing was developing these rituals that helped him sort of rein in that tendency. So he had some space. So he basically had some gaps, like what I'm talking about. And I talk about the ritual in that chapter. I won't get into the details now. But I use that as a transition to talk about what some of the cutting-edge technology companies are doing 
in trying to wean their own employees who are making these devices away from the screen because they're finding their employees are not as creative and productive as they should be. Ironically enough, the people who've brought us these devices are at the leading edge of trying to actually create a little distance so they can continue to be competitive. And it's manifested itself in the most fascinating way in this clip we're going to see now, which is, maybe I shouldn't even say who it's from. We should watch it yeah. first. Yeah, yeah, let's watch it. Okay. It's from Thailand, I'll say that. <coughs> this is a television ad. Now that is a television ad aired and paid for by the largest telecom company in Thailand, trying to get people to do something that arguably would be incredibly bad for their bottom line, actually, which is turn off your phone and come back to the real world. But it's interesting, the technologists themselves are onto this problem. It was the last thing I expected to discover after my book came out. I discovered this video after the book came out. It's got millions of hits on YouTube. Mm. Uh, people are passing it around everywhere. And, but it is related to a moment I have in the book where um, I talk about, I'm trying to find it here, I talk about um, Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, giving a commencement speech at, um, at the University of Pennsylvania in uh, 2009, and this, was a, this is a passage from Eric Schmidt's advice to the graduates of the University of Pennsylvania two years ago. Turn off your computer. You're actually going to have to turn off your phone and discover all that is human around us. The chairman of Google with the same message. And in fact, since my book has come out, among the places I've found myself speaking is both Google and Facebook, coincidentally, on the same day because they are struggling with this issue mm. more, more um, in, in, a, in a more challenging way than I think most of us are because they're not just creating the devices, they're on them or on the clock and it's driving them nuts, really. Mm. Yeah, okay, well, um, so what, what, let's come back to the, the, the question from the lawyer, if you like, about the, you know, fine story, but what am I gonna, you know, how can I do that in my life? And yes. I think, um, that feels that feels like a very familiar story to me in, in my own life, but and and it seems to happen with the, the nation's politicians. I think both here and in your country, there's a sort of particularly toxic sort of political atmosphere going on, which which I wouldn't say it's the only thing. I would say it's an element or a strand in it, but it seems to be the they're all going a little bit nuts by the by the constant demands on their time all day, all night, and. Um, so, okay, how, how do those people, how do they wean themselves off? I mean, I think you and your family sort of engaged in an experiment, if you like, on, on this, which you called the Internet Sabbath. Yes, so my basic answer to your question is that it's a very hard challenge to get your arms around when you're talking about something as macro, if you will, as big as like what's happening in Washington, you yeah. know, or what's yeah. happening in any government. It, it, it is striking to me that Washington is the most BlackBerry-obsessed city in the United States. I mean, you go there and everybody is really, literally like this. 
and we can't seem to solve any of these problems. You know, put a budget together, get a healthcare system that works. And I'm not blaming it all on digital connectedness, but I don't think it's helping the communication that we are deciding to communicate via this one very particular mm -hmm. means, rather than necessarily just having conversations and all these other ways we have of communicating and also of stepping back and reflecting and coming up with solutions that maybe you can't find on the screen. But in any case, I think the beginning of the answer is with every individual to sort of A, have their consciousness raised about this and B, to begin to do something about it in their own lives, which is what I viewed the main purpose of the book to do, which is to get people thinking about this and taking actions in their own lives so they're more balanced. So the example I give from my own life, and I'm, I'm not prescribing this for everybody else because, as you'll see, it wouldn't work for everybody, but my wife and I are both writers. She also writes books, and so we have a very flexible schedule. We work at home, though, which makes it challenging balancing work and home life. So we realized to kind of combat this vanishing family issue that we were dealing with as a family, we just decided to go back to the old-fashioned idea of a weekend and turn off the internet, the mode, the household modem that serves all our computers on Friday night, and leave it off till Monday morning. We started doing this before I even wrote the book. We're into our fourth year now of this ritual. We just named it right from the start. We named it the Internet Sabbath. We'd never heard of anybody else who'd done this. It turns out that lots of people were trying the same thing right around the same time and have continued to. There's a whole movement in the US, maybe here too, called digital sabbaticals, which is actually driven more by younger people than older people. In our case, and I relate this in the book, it was incredibly challenging. It was unbelievably, um, it was almost hilarious how pathetic we were. <laughs> the first couple months, really, the first, particularly the first few weekends, we were totally lost without the internet. It was like we didn't know who we were. We were wandering around the house. It seemed like an alien house, actually, because it wasn't connected. We kept making these little trails to our screens as if we could go there and check something, and all of a sudden we couldn't. There were tears from a certain party, who you can imagine which one it was. Bring back the internet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> could have been me. But it was my son, who was, yeah, I guess, nine at the time. And um, we just had to kind of encourage each other through this and talk about it and find new things to do with our time. And, but a wonderful thing happened, and I relate this in the book. As time went by, it not only got easier, we began to realize, in both senses of the word realize, all these incredible benefits that were very subtle at first. But as they dawned on us, we realized how important they were and powerful. We got eye contact back. Our minds slowed down on the weekends. We got to that place where we could really listen, we could really think, we could really have that sort of grounded feeling mm. that is, mm. you know, what I'm really aiming for in life. I mean, it's been called flow, it's been called all these different names over the years, but it's basically that wonderful state of being right here, right now, present in your own life and connected to people and to the things around you and to the world around you in the best possible way, you know, really alive, vital showing up for your life, I like to call it. You know, here I am, I'm showing up for my own life. It came back on the weekends, and the beauty of it, the real miracle, was that when we went back to our digital lives during the week, some of that carried over. We were actually better digital people because we'd been away from it for a few days a week. So the paradox is that in order to connect better with your own life, as you're describing, yes. you need to disconnect from yes. various things for various times. But also to connect better with your own digital life. I mean, I think I'm a better Facebook person because okay. I have this time away, and we're okay. still doing this ritual. People often ask me, okay, your son's 13 now, he couldn't possibly still be doing this. You know, he is, actually. He's, he's really a convert. He chafes against it sometimes. Everybody's on, you know, Facebook doing something, and I'm not there, you know. But he's also learned to use it as a little bit of a wedge with his friends where he kind of suggests, you know, if we put our phones away and go out into the woods to this fort I'm building, the parents won't know where we are. You know, want, want to try something dangerous or do you have to be tethered to your parents all the time? You know, and the kids are kind of like, whoa, you know, I haven't heard that challenge before. <laughs> and so he's become a little bit of a proselytizer for this notion yeah. that there's something good about being untethered. Yeah. And this is a whole su subject we haven't brought up, but in the yeah. book I talk about autonomy and the importance of being a self-contained person who has your own ideas, your own sense of groundedness, the ability to be alone once in a while and to yeah. enjoy it is, yeah. I think, a very important part of being a happy person. Okay. Um, I'd like to come to questions in a minute for anyone um, who, who, would, who would like to um, ask a question, but just before we do that, I, 
I'm reminded of something that you said to me that I think someone else had, had asked you either at a conference or in a review. They said that um, this book uh, is like an introvert's dream. Yes. You know? um, uh, how did you respond to that sort of? Because it sort of does go to something about what you're saying. That was actually a tweet. A that, tweet. Yeah, I'm on Twitter. I actually love Twitter, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody tweeted about the book one day, uh, this Hamlet's Blackberry, an introvert's dream. And it got me thinking about the notion that we are all on this, these different spectrums of personality and temperament. And some people really are more introverted and some people are more extroverted. I think I may actually be an introvert because I, I like alone time. And I like speaking to large groups and sort of performing. And the in-between stuff, I'm not as comfortable with. And that's apparently the classic introvert. So this person may actually be onto something in the mm -hmm. sense that I was the person who naturally would write this book because I have that peculiar sensitivity to, to that, those kinds of situations. But I do think that what I learned from my tour of history is that that balance between alone time and crowd time and everything that's in-between is something that everybody has to learn to manage, no matter what your preferences are, no matter what your temperament is. You're, you're navigating life. You may not need two days off a week to achieve the kind of balance that I achieve. You just may need an hour a day, you know, or an hour every other day, depending on who you are. Everybody has different tolerances, but the message of my suggesting these kinds of experiments, um, this, you know, kind of designs for your own life, is that we all need some version of it. This is a very powerful revolution we're living through, and it has enormous potential. But we need to be in the driver's seat. We shouldn't have the gadgets leading us around. We should be in charge of the gadgets. And I, when I walk around the streets of every city in the world, including Melbourne, and I see everybody bumping into each other because they're just stuck right here, I just don't think that's actually the smartest way to live. And I don't think it's going to take us to a good place because if, if we keep going this way, we'll wind up allowing the gadgets to make us less human rather than more. And as the story about my mother shows, they can make us more human. Mm. They can take us to a better place, but we have to make sure that happens. Okay. All right. Well, let's, um, let's see if, who's got some questions. Yes. Thank you. Jim Woodring, who's a comic, mm -hmm. was talking about his 25-year-old son's portable heroin device, he called it, which was his phone, his right. Blackberry or iPhone. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was saying that that meant that his son was never ever bored um, mm -hmm. and that that was a real problem for creative people and for creativity itself, that if you're not bored, you can't actually, your brain can't actually try and force through that boredom to, to notice anything and to, and to do anything creative. So he was kind of suggesting that creativity itself could die if we all kind of mm -hmm. wandered around attached in this weird connected way. Yes. Um, so that was the one thing that I wanted to ask you about. And the other thing was just that I was in the doctor's surgery the other day and 95% of people were engaged with their iPhones and no one was looking at each other. And I wondered if we were already cyborgs. Yeah, you know, I know. Like, it feels like that sometimes. That's how it, it felt. You know, I mean, it's not actually yet attached into our skin, but I don't think it's going to take very long. Well, and some people speak about the implant as this glorious future where we'll just have it in, in, some kind of a chip in here and we'll be able to be following Twitter, you know, without even having a device in our hand. And I just, it just doesn't sound that great to me, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, there are some people who want that, but I can't imagine what they're thinking. But to go to your boredom question, there is a really wonderful rising awareness, at least in the States, and I imagine it's here too because we're all connected, so we're all sharing information, of boredom among parents in particular, of the power of boredom and the need to get back to boredom. I have found it anecdotally with my friends where we're actually, like, trying to get the kids to be bored more often, so that they can go back to their own resources and come up with their own forms of play. You know, inventing your own kinds of play is one of the most important ways we learn to be creative and to harness our creativity. And these kids are, it's all coming at them. They're becoming passive about play because of Mario Kart and all this stuff that just does it for them. And, you know, there's nothing ultimately wrong with video games per se. I have a problem with the violent ones, but you know, playing a game on a video device is fine. I mean, we've had it for decades, really, when you think about the early TV games. But if that's all, it's the only way you know how to play as a machine is doing it for you, you're not, again, becoming the fully human, creative person that you could be. Um, so I think that's a very important aspect of the parenting part that we need to be aware of, and you clearly are, which is a great thing. Um, on the cyborg question, 
I go back to my tour of history again, and this is something that people have really confronted over and over again, the fear that the device will take over and destroy the best parts of us. And I, I sort of laid out that threat a little bit, but I ultimately believe that we, we, we have always figured it out in the past. And the very first philosopher I use is Plato, who has a story about Socrates, um, which is a kind of a complicated story I can't recount all of here, but Socrates was dead set against written language because he said it would destroy our minds if we use these letters, which, which frees thought on the page rather than allowing it to grow the way it grows in the Socratic conversation. And I think most of, in the, in the, most of us in this room would agree he was wrong about that. You know, he, he, he had wonderful motives. He wanted people to stay as human as they possibly can and not become hostage to technologies. But he didn't see that if you use the technology wisely, in this case the alphabet, it can take you to a wonderful place. So I think there is reason to believe that though we can fear the cyborg future, we're all in touch with the threat enough to avoid it. I mean, here we are talking about this. And my book has been very widely read in the US, which I think is a great, I take as a great sign. And there's also been a whole wave of books like this. So I think consciousness is, is, is growing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, lady just behind, just behind, behind you. you. Thank you for the talk. I also nearly cried when I saw that ad. Um, in your research for the book, have you found any differences between how men and women react to all these devices? I mean, a man who can multitask is an evolutionary thing. Can't yeah, be that yeah, bad. Yeah. <laughs> yes. There is. I didn't look at this specifically for the book. I have since come across um, studies that talk about this, with, that women are just better multitaskers, generally speaking. But a more powerful um, indicator of how good someone is going to be at that is actually more individual personality and sort of mental makeup. And so there are people, according to a University of California study, 2% of us are super taskers which means that we actually can effectively do two or three tasks at once and get things done. 2%. Okay, that is a really small number of people. Generally speaking, the other 98% of us, which I would include me in the 98%, really cannot effectively multitask. It does not work. You're actually becoming less efficient and not doing your best work when you're multitasking. And I think that is pretty much gender neutral. So I hope that helps. Mm -hmm. OK. Another question yeah, down. Mark, Sorry, can you just wait for the? Very <coughs> I think they want to get the, um, yeah. on the audio. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, as a professional writer, given uh, the new technology, the digital technology is actually changing readers, how is that going to uh, impact what is actually written? Yes, great question. Um, I, I wouldn't hazard a prediction on that. I do think that just looking at the writing that is produced today across all genres, um, it does have a feeling, generally speaking, of being um, short, shorter attention span reading produced by shorter attention span writers. We're tending to write in smaller bites because we're aware on some level that everybody is like us and they're reading in smaller bites and we're trying to kind of meet that need. Um, I think that's been going on for a long time. If you look back at the 19th century, Dostoevsky, George Eliot, these incredible big novels that people used to write where, you know, a moment, Henry James, a moment could be described for 10 pages before you get to the subtle little thing that happened in that moment. It doesn't, we're not doing that anymore. Partly it's more of a, of a reflection of how we're living. So in a sense, fiction and nonfiction alike is sort of accurately reflecting what's happening out there in the street. But I do think we are, it's changing, it's evolving, not necessarily for the worse. You know, it's, if it's reflecting how we live, I think that's what art and nonfiction should do. Um, but I can't predict where it's headed. Can I, um, sorry, well, uh, let's take your question first. So the, you've got the microphone. The, maybe the, the gentleman there? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Look, Thank you. there's two, a two-pronged question. One connected to the comment about Socrates and the denial of the use of the brain for development of, of storytelling, because I'd cross-reference that, that to the mythology of many civilizations and how important that is with a connection to the land. It's worth thinking about. Uh, and the, but the, 
main question I want to ask is, have you read the brain that changes itself and, the, and has there been a, a studies or connection of what you're talking about to the overdevelopment of certain neurons which may in turn lead to you know, serious sort of uh, overdevelopment of certain parts of, the, of our uh, uh, capacities? Yes, so on the first question, you were asking me about Socrates, whether um, there's been similar warnings in other cultures about the dangers of technology and the alphabet in particular, or is that the question? Well, yes, but also but the fact that a lot of the mythology in which those civilizations are based were, were you know, oral or oral. Systems. Oral, yes, yes. Well, the, the Socrates, it's a great question. The Socrates warning is fascinating to me because on one sense, as I said, he was wrong. The, the culture of writing and the alphabet has enriched civilization in manifold ways. I mean, I'm a writer, so I sort of have to believe that, but I do. But in another sense, you know, he was arguing for conversation as the richest form of exchange because ideas can change in real time and go to unexpected places when you're having a conversation like we are right now. And I actually think that's still true. You know, there is something that happens in an oral exchange that is more serendipitous and, 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 and not, as he said, not frozen on the page. And there's, you know, writing a letter to the editor about an article you read is different from having a conversation with the person about that article. And there's a, there's a kind of a vitality to oral exchange that is different. And I just think he didn't see, he only saw the downside of the new device, which if you can call the alphabet a device, and didn't see the upside. Um, and to your second question, which was about plasticity, neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. I think this busyness that a lot of us are feeling in our minds, where we're kind of becoming short attention span thinkers, is an example of the brain changing in very complex ways that people like Nicholas Carr have written about very well. And there are books that are dedicated to how technology is changing the brain. And I think we can all feel the results day by day, hour by hour, and how we think. That's one of the reasons I wrote my book. But I also have learned from our little ritual, the Internet Sabbath, that if you take a break on a regular basis, you can actually rewire it back in the other direction and keep those other channels for longer thoughts, if you will, for slower modes of thinking open so they're accessible anytime you need them. I mean, that is what I have found this particular ritual has done for me, which is I definitely have the short attention span circuits that I use when I'm on Twitter and these other tools. But I've got the other ones, too, because I'm keeping those channels going by having this other space I live in on a regular basis. Plasticity can work in both directions, I think. Any more questions? I've, I've got one final one, if no one else has another one. It's just to do with the, the, the new digital reading devices, the iPod and yeah. um, the iPad, I should say, and others of that kind. Um, do you think they're going to change the nature of reading, or, or how, or if, and if they are, in what ways that might be both positive and potentially have downsides? Well, I think my chapter, one of my philosophers in the book is Gutenberg. Mm. And I have him as a philosopher, even though he was actually a businessman and a technologist, because he took something, a, a, a technology that was the province of the rich and the elite, and he made it available to everyone. Mm. And Books were available to everyone before Gutenberg, but you had to be in public to hear someone read a book aloud. You had to be in the crowd. And he allowed people to go off and have that inward, private experience that we know is reading, that is so powerful. And I think that if our new reading devices, Kindles and so forth, move in the direction of maximum connectedness, where they can interrupt us with emails and, and, hyperlinks and yeah, hyperlinks, and here's what this other person said about that sentence, even when you're reading it for the first time. You know, there's a version of this book that you can read that is all the public comments are visible while you're reading it, and what other people underlined and everything while you're reading it for the first time, which to me is not a useful way to read a book for the first time. Mm in the crowd, essentially. It's like moving backwards to the pre-Gutenberg time. When so you that, were that kind exists of, at present, that's the... Yes, you can do that on one of the devices. I don't know if it's the Kindle. Okay. I haven't done it myself, but you, yeah. people have told me, I've read your book in social mode, one person <laughs> called it. And I saw all these fascinating, and I'm sure they're fascinating, but yeah. I'd want to do that like the second time around, not the yeah. first time around. Yeah. I'd want my own inward experience. But I think that experience that we've been having for all these hundreds of years is so powerful. And we know that. I mean, it's what education mm. is teaching us to do when we read, that we're not going to let go of that. 
And perhaps there will be a segment of people, maybe the more extroverted people who will want to read that way all the time, who don't value the inward time as much. But I think for many of us, that is so powerful that we're not just going to want to continue to do it and have the devices help us do that, but that we will pass that on to future mm. generations. These not to be a Pollyanna, but I do no. tend to be an optimist. These are the sort of people who eat and chew gum and do everything else at the cinema yeah. while you're trying to watch a film and Super talk. Supertaskers, yeah. 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 yeah, okay. Um, look, thank you very much thank for your, you. uh, for your you, talk. Matthew. I think it's been terrific, and I'd like you to like, you know, join me in thanking thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>